The Nintendo 64 disk drive, as is widely known, was a commercial failure. What would have been the home of some of the system's biggest titles, like The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, Kirby 64, The Crystal Shards, and Paper Mario, wound up being nothing more but a misstep that Nintendo didn't care about, only being kept on life support by Randnet itself. But the Nintendo 64 DD had a strong ace up its sleeve, which was demonstrated in one of the add-on's few release titles, the F-Zero X Expansion Kit. One of the major plans with the Nintendo 64 disk drive was to supply gamers with new content for games they already owned, prolonging the length of a game or giving a new experience for a player's second playthrough. This would have been done via expansion discs. All that was needed was a Nintendo 64 with a disk drive add-on, a standard cartridge game, and an expansion disc made for said game, in a sense very similar to what Sega did with Sonic 3 and Knuckles in 1994. As mentioned before, the only title to ever receive said expansion kit was F-Zero X, but many more were planned, which is the focus of today's video. After all of its killer apps were cancelled, moved over to a standard cartridge, or moved to a different system entirely, the F-Zero X expansion kit ended up taking the throne as the Nintendo 64 disk drive's killer app, showcasing not only its ability to expand pre-existing games, but also its read and write capabilities. Through the use of this disk, one has access to multiple different features, such as brand new racers, two brand new cups, stereo audio, a track editor, and a machine creator. A few of these features are actually left over as incomplete code for the original F-Zero X, hinting at these possibly being either features they wanted to include from the start, or that the expansion kit had already been greenlit. The two new cups are extremely fun, while also being pretty challenging. Though to be fair, I haven't played F-Zero X since like freshman year or high school, so my F-Zero X skills are rusty, but even a casual player can enjoy them. But the biggest highlights of this expansion are the customization options available to use at launch. The machine creator allows one to create their own unique car using a number of preset parts and pieces. It's not much, but it's fun making cool vehicles with my friends. I only wish I could play with said friends, but being in a different state and country simply don't allow me to. The course editor itself is really something more racing games need. While it's a little overwhelming at first, and pretty confusing, once you get into the swing of things, you can make some absolute masterpieces. The course editor itself is actually something made during development for creating the actual courses itself. Later on, we'll release a track editor that allows users to create tracks using the 64DD. Any regular user can set up their own tracks. You can race a little, adjust so-and-so area to be a little more S-shaped, and stuff like that while you're making the track. It's sort of like craftsmanship. There are some tracks made by programmers like OTA rather than by the designers. When we made courses, we wanted to test them right away. For example, if you make them at a workstation, you have to put the data in the game to test it, and that really just turns into more work. For example, I made this course called Moon RPG because it's shaped like a crescent moon, and if you go fast, you fucking die. So there goes my butt Squishy's car, McClunky, flying to its doom. The F-Zero X expansion kit really is the perfect example of the 64DD's features, which makes it all the more unfortunate that the 64DD was basically killed by its constant delays and weird subscription model. <laughs> While never officially announced by Nintendo, the original Mario Party in the Nintendo 64 has leftover code meant for an expansion kit. The game is programmed to check for a disc with either the code ELBJ or ELBE depending on the region. And when a disc is inserted into the 64DD while Mario Party is in the cartridge slot, the game will ask the player to replace the disc with the correct disc, assumedly the Mario Party expansion kit. There also exists two errors, one for the expansion pack, which is required for the Nintendo 64DD to work, and one for a disc access error. Seeing as an expansion disc was never even announced, it's unknown what it would have contained, whether that be new boards, new minigames, or maybe the ability to create your own board like with F-Zero X's expansion kit, though that's all just speculation. What's likely is that with The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask and Mario Party 2 came out of ideas started from the development of expansion disc. Mario Party 2 was built using the same engine as the original game, with many leftovers and even earlier screenshots still using assets from it, like the HUD. Though that is all speculation, with an explanation never being given. According to multiple IGN articles, the games Automobili Lamborghini, Quest for Camelot, and Superman 64 were to have full 64DD support with additional expansion discs released afterwards. Now, Automobili Lamborghini's expansion disc would have been straightforward, as Titus themselves apparently confirmed what it was, additional tracks for the game. Automobili Lamborghini is actually a somewhat competent racing game, pretty good to control and fun to play. More racetracks seems like it'd be pretty good, especially considering the size of the 64DD discs. 
But for Quest for Camelot and Superman 64, nothing was ever said about them and honestly, what the hell could have they been done? Quest for Camelot never even came out on the Nintendo 64 and the only thing I can imagine for Superman 64 is finishing the game. There were two reasons why these expansion discs never came into being. The first was given by Robert Stevens, a programmer at Titus. We had hoped to add a bit of 64DD support, but we still have not received the documentation from Nintendo. Wave goodbye to those extra tracks. Eric Kahn, one of the two brothers who founded Titus Interactive, later gave his own reasons as to why 64DD plans were cut. The main problem with the 64DD is the same as for any other new hardware. It needs at least one killer app to be attractive for customers. I'm not sure that any great game is ready for 64DD yet, so I am not sure about this hardware's release date. Pocket Monsters Stadium, also known to Western fans as Pokemon Stadium Zero, is the first game in the Pokemon Stadium spin-off series, and is notorious for the fact that only 40 of the original 151 Pokemon are playable in-game. This was not meant to be the case, as the rest of the 111 Pokemon were also meant to be unlockable via the expansion kit. The game itself was actually meant for the 64DD and was shown off at Space World 1997 in disc form but was switched to a regular cartridge after the 64DD's multiple delays, causing the game itself to be delayed. In fact, all the Pokemon are present in the game, most of them only being viewable via the game's Pokedex. The game looks for a game code somewhere between EPSJ to ZPSJ, with the disc allowing the player to access the Pokemon in regular battle. Unfortunately, due to even more delays with the 64DD itself, the expansion disc itself would end up being cancelled and being turned into the sequel, Pocket Monster Stadium 2 known in the West as, simply, Pokemon Stadium. Despite already having all 151 Pokemon from the get-go, Pocket Monster Stadium 2 was planned to also get a 64DD expansion disc. One might assume that this is simply a leftover code from the first game, but the game actually checks for unique game code, which would have been somewhere around EP2J to ZP2J. Though unlike the first game, there isn't really anything known about this expansion kit. It's possible that Generation 2 Pokemon could have been added, and it simply evolved into Pocket Monster Stadium, Gold, Silver, and Crystal, seeing how Generation 2 only released a few months after Stadium 2, but that's simply speculation. Dezaemon 3D is the Nintendo 64 entry in the Dezaemon series, a creation tool for making shmups. It's very interesting and I don't really understand it that well, but it's sort of like Mario Paint on the SNES and Mario Artist games on the 64DD, making your own art and music for your game. Check out this game, it's called Roadhouse. Dezaemon DD was the game's planned expansion kit, sorta. Originally believed to be a full-on sequel to Dezaemon 3D, utilizing the DD's modem capabilities, Dezaemon DD was actually a storage system. It's only programmed to expand slash remove the limits of the game itself, such as available models and images, and saving multiple games on the 64DD discs. It's actually a pretty good example of the 64DD's read-write capabilities, since the original game only allows the player to save one game onto the cartridge itself. This game was supposed to be one of the later 64DD releases, after the first six titles, but it seems like the game was cancelled possibly due to low sales. In addition to the six free software titles, various other original software titles are being developed. All of these will be available for mail order on the RANNET website. Now luckily, multiple prototypes of Dezaemon DD have been found over the years, with the latest being from February 1998. It's interesting to see what later builds could have added, if anything new. Anyways, it's a great glimpse into what could have been. Mario no Photopi is a weird pseudo-sequels, pseudo-photoshop alternative for the Nintendo 64, using smart media cards via slots on the cartridge. It's really hard to explain, you really need to play it for yourself. Anyways, those smart media cards can hold extremely low amounts of data, like these official Mario no Photopi ones that can hold 2 megabytes. but this wasn't the only storage format planned for the game. Originally, this generic Photopi game would have allowed players to use 64DD discs as a storage format, holding the 32 times the amount of data as the cards. Similarly to Dezaemon DD, it's unclear if these would have been their own standalone expansion cartridges or if it would have taken USD on the release blank discs that would have been available for purchase. Furthermore, when connected to the 64DD high-speed magnetic disk drive, an N64 expansion unit scheduled for release next June by Nintendo, it will be possible to file a large amount of image data stored on smart media on its dedicated 64 disk, 64 megabytes, enabling the creation of electronic albums without a PC. Despite the press release only mentioning using the 64DD discs as a storage format, it's completely possible that they could have also been used as illustration collections. 
When Mario no Fotopi was released, alongside it came multiple different smart media cards featuring illustrations ranging from generic borders to other characters such as Bomberman and Yoshi. It's possible that 64DD discs similar to those smart media cards could have also been planned. Unfortunately, when the game was released under the name Mario no Fotopi in December 1998, almost all mention of 64DD connectivity was completely cut from the game, minus two error messages. Please insert the memory expansion and restart the power. Please connect the N64 main unit and 64DD properly and restart the power. While no reason was given as to why the 64DD connectivity was cut, it was likely due to the multiple delays the 64DD received in 1998, to the point where it was uncertain if the machine was going to even come out. Mother 3.5 is the most rumored Nintendo 64 DD expansion kit besides Ura Zelda, which is incredible for something that never even existed. On August 13th, 1999, two weeks before Space World 1999, IGN released an article named Mother 3.5, claiming that an expansion disc was coming for the now cartridge-based game. The producer of Nintendo's anticipated Mother 3, called Earthbound 64 in the US, revealed new details about the game to the Japanese press recently. Though the title has been purposely kept very secret for the past six months, development has been coming along steadily, and, as Nintendo's Space World list recently revealed, the title will be playable at the Japan-based show later this month. Though the game was shifted over to a cartridge from its original 64DD form last year, Mother 3's producer also made mention of a 64DD expansion disc for the title, which is currently being called Mother 3.5. No details regarding the expansion have been made available, though it is expected to serve up an entirely new quest and characters, but utilize the same game engine as the cartridge game. IGN64 will play Mother 3, Earthbound 64, in Japan later this month. Stay with us for more. Many of the concepts that were promised and theorized for Ura Zelda in the original 64DD version of Ocarina of Time were also pushed onto this, along with the original 64DD version of Mother 3. Alongside this was connectivity with Mario Artist Paint Studio, where the player would be able to put their face onto the in-game characters, commonly associated with the small child named Hiroki. In reality, this kid here was the winner of a contest to be in Mother 3, and in fact, the concepts that were said for 64DD related stuff in Mother 3 was never actually a thing. As I said before, Mother 3.5 was never actually a product that existed which was confirmed as early as the Space World 99 event itself, when a player asked one of the survey folk about the Nintendo 64 DD in relation to Mother 3. I was wondering, is the game still coming out on the N64 DD that's in development? Apparently, it doesn't have to do with the N64 DD, so it isn't going to use the extra data transferring speeds. Too bad. So, where did IGN get this information from? They most likely mistranslated an interview with Shigeru Miyamoto, where he only says an expansion kit would be beneficial for Mother 3. The strong point of a cart is that it can exchange data in real time. A cart's big advantage is running the basic engine, but if you're thinking about exchanging more data and producing lots of data, the DD system is more fitting for the task than a cart. For a game like Mother 3, which uses more data and needs to run in real time, using a cart and a DD is a perfect mix. The final nail in the coffin comes from Akihiro Miyoda, Mother 3's programmer, when he was asked about it on Twitter in 2011. I think there might be a plan about releasing an add-on for the miserable 64DD platform, but no specific action was done. I asked my buddy Sai, who's the dude narrating the video, what his thoughts on 3.5 are, and this is what he told me. This expansion isn't real, please stop talking about it. In 1996, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, then known as Zelda 64, was switched from a Nintendo 64 disk drive disk to a standard Nintendo 64 cartridge. But even after the switch, there were still plans to utilize the 64DD. As early as 1997, Miyamoto commented about how Ocarina of Time was already designed with connectivity to the 64DD, telling the staff at Nintendo Power, This game was designed so it can be applied to the disk drive system, and by hooking up the N64DD, you could play another version of Zelda. By that method, all the dungeons will be replaced by new ones. I think that will be the next Zelda we will make. And as such, the idea for an expansion kit for The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time was born. With at most new dungeons. During an interview with IGN in 1999, Miyamoto further elaborated, You once mentioned that Zelda was being designed with an open architecture and that you will eventually work on an add-on adventure. Are you still going ahead with Ura Zelda? 
Yes, this installment of Zelda has been designed with the introduction of the DD disk drive system in mind. If the DD system is connected to your N64 and you play the cartridge Zelda, you can see on the title screen Ura, another version of Zelda. That kind of program has already been incorporated. There were several ideas that I could not incorporate into this specific game because of time constraints and other similar reasons. I want to have some new areas or new dungeons for the people who have already finished the game, in which they can have sometimes more difficult and more fun dungeons and so forth. As is well known, the Ocarina of Time expansion disc, famously known as Ura Zelda by fans in the gaming press, was never released, leading to much rampant fan speculation. Many took the line, there were several ideas that I could not incorporate into this specific game because of the time constraints and similar other reasons, as a hint that Ura Zelda would restore multiple beta features meant for the original Nintendo 64 DD version of Zelda 64, such as leaving footsteps on the ground that would stay forever, sword beams, or the ability to collect the Triforce. It didn't help that retail Ocarina of Time already had leftovers relating to 64 DD, such as a disc tag for the title screen and file select, and leftover text slash code relating to it searching for the game's code EZLJ and EZLE based on region. Due to this, Ura Zelda became title of Legend, the lost third grand N64 Zelda game, alongside the original Ocarina of Time and its sequel, Majora's Mask. In reality, Ura Zelda had already been completed as early as 2000, and in fact was already released, just not on the Nintendo 64 DD. In 2003, as a pre-order bonus for The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker, Players received the Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time bonus disc, which featured the original Ocarina of Time in a bonus mode known as Master Quest worldwide, but known as Ocarina of Time Ura in Japan. Following the release, Miyamoto talked about how long it had been since the 64DD, along with a general overview of it, stating, Although we did develop Ura for the 64DD, it didn't use many of the special features, so it was very easy to port over to the GameCube without cutting any features. Why we did it? Well, that was because the 64DD was only released in Japan, and it was only sold to subscribers of the RANNET system. Also, I'm not sure if you're aware, but Ura Zelda isn't very different from the Ocarina of Time. It's more of a second quest. People who played through Ocarina of Time would be able to play through Ura Zelda and get a few lasts and some things, find some things more difficult, and take a few varied paths. However, even if you do play all the way through the end, it will not unlock anything special. In truth, while Ura Zelda was finished, it had been cancelled due to a combination of multiple different factors. By the time the 64DD was released via its subscription service, the developers tried finding an alternative way to release the title, such as magazine giveaways, but decided against it. One of the other reasons was simply due to the developer disinterest. Aiji Aonuma, Ocarina of Time's dungeon designer and man put in charge of altering dungeons for Ura Zelda, said, but we were already talking about trying to make Master Quest for Nintendo 64DD. We were told to repurpose the dungeons from Ocarina of Time and make a game out of it. And I was handed the baton to make that happen. However, when we made Ocarina of Time, we made those dungeons thinking they were the best we could make. That's when Miyamoto-san asked me to remake them, so I hesitantly obliged. But I couldn't really get into it. So I secretly started making new dungeons that weren't in Ocarina of Time, and that was much more fun to me. So I grew the courage to ask Miyamoto-san whether I could make a new game. He replied by saying it's okay if I can make it in a year. That game would become the previously mentioned Majora's Mask, which began development in February 1999 and released in 2000 in the span of an entire year. Even after the release of Master Quest in 2003, many fans still believe that Ura Zelda was a completely different game, outright calling Miyamoto's statement about the game a lie. However, leftover code and assets in the final Ocarina of Time show otherwise. Ocarina of Time's 64D connectivity was actually extremely limited, only having the ability to exchange specific files such as dungeons, dungeon-related content, and text. This is unlike the majority of other 64DD expansion kits, like Mario Party and F-Zero X, where the game loads a portion of code and executes it. The final nail in the coffin comes from the July 2020 Nintendo Giga Leaks, where partial source code for Ocarina of Time featured multiple unused maps. Not only were some of the early dungeons made during Ayanuma's pre-Majora's Mask present, but all of Ura Zelda's dungeons were present, revealing to be earlier versions of Master Quest's dungeons, alongside its original logo. Ura Zelda has thankfully been restored by Ocarina of Time fan modder Zeth64 as a patch for base Ocarina of Time, along with a version fully functional on 64DD ported by Yakumono, known as Zelda Expansion, or The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time Discs, as the title screen calls it. As Mr. Miyamoto said, Ura Zelda is basically Ocarina of Time's second quest, a much harder playthrough of the game with remixed dungeons, similar to how the first two Zelda games did it back on the Famicom Disk system. 
As mentioned before, the 64DD connectivity for this game is purely for modifying dungeons, so everything else is pretty much exactly the same as the original 1998 cartridge release. The new remix dungeons, while built on top of the original dungeon layouts, are incredibly mean and at some points unfair. Areas like Inside Jabu Jabu's Belly have such cryptic bullshit in them, like using opponent song and specific Blades of Grass to trigger events, which the game never tells you about at any point. The later dungeons get a little better, but become much more like the released 2003 Master Quest version as you get further along into it. As for said 2003 version, a lot of the much meaner puzzles have been removed, with places like Inside Jabu Jabu's Belly being reworked almost completely. Arguably, it doesn't leave as strong as an impression as the DD dungeons do, but they are much more balanced and would later become the basis for the version found in The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time 3D. That game features the 2003 Master Quest layouts while also flipping the entire game, a la Twilight Princess Wii, and doubling damage. It's a genuine struggle to find what would have been 64DD prices as the system was only sold via subscription and never at retail. But judging by assumptions based on estimates shared by Nintendo employees at the time of its planned 1998 release, uh, retail 64DD discs could have been sold for as low as 1,045 yen in today's money, or about $7 USD. In fact, a player could have possibly gotten it for cheaper on a 64DD disc writer, which would have been about 522 yen, or 3 US dollars in today's money, not counting the cost of a blank disc. For owners of both a 64DD and Ocarina of Time, spending almost $10 more for some insanely difficult remix dungeons isn't such a bad price. But again, the game was never released and the 64DD never hit retail, so we'll never be certain. So, that was the world of mispotential Potential and Crush Dreams known as the 64DD Expansion Kits. It's completely possible that there were more planned, as some of these are only from leftover data, but we won't know unless some more information comes out. Thanks for watching. Join again next time where we talk about something like if Alec was in Earthbound 64 or something. Leave a like and a comment, any ideas for videos you want to see in the future.